So um, today's seminar speaker is Sonia Martinez from UC San Diego. Uh, Sonia received her PhD um, from Carlos III University in Madrid in 2002 in engineering, engineering mathematics. And afterwards, she was a visiting professor at the University of Catalonia for a short while, and then a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Illinois, and then at the University of California, Santa Barbara. In 2005, she moved to UCSD, San Diego, as an assistant professor, and she's been there since. And she's, her primary work is on our distributed control of robotic platforms, and she's the co-author of a popular book on this topic. So we'll hear about the latest in this direction. Okay. Thanks, welcome. Thank you, Murat. Um, and thanks, everybody, to come to my seminar today. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about another uh, new, uh, new viewpoint on this uh, large-scale uh, swarm coordination, making emphasis on the fact that you have a very large uh, swarm, right? And so we look at questions of analysis and design in these systems. Uh, to do this, uh, we are going to employ continuous relaxations, which is another word for uh, fluid models or partial differential equations. Okay, and this is joint work with uh, grad student Vishal Krishnan. So, but before I go into that, for those of, of you who don't know me, uh, this is a summary of topics that I've worked on. So, started to work on um, the control of underactuated mechanical systems using uh, nonlinear dynamics and geometric control. Then I moved to um, the stabilization of uh, multi agent uh, systems uh, using hybrid systems theory type of tools, uh, looking at um, dynamical constraints, limitations imposed by communication, sensing especially trying to uh, design algorithms that would employ these resources in an economic way, okay, like in an event trigger fashion. Then I, I also have worked on um, the control of infrastructure systems through distributed optimization and game theoretic tools, uh, like power and traffic system more recently. Uh, but my, as I, Murat says, you know, my primary uh, application area are multiple vehicles, estimation for these vehicles, and control of these vehicles. Okay, I won't be able to talk about these topics in a lot of detail, many of these, but if you have questions later, you can always uh, talk to me later. Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about very large-scale systems, um, and why is that? Because, well, uh, systems like this are becoming increasingly pervasive. We can take any uh, physical system today and basically enlarge it, enlarge it with a communication, computation, and sensing sensor module. Okay, and then you can take these systems together, interconnect them, and create these large uh, complex networks. And so uh, we have examples of this uh, today, right? Around us, we have uh, large communication sensor networks, the Internet of Things type of networks. Uh, these um, are going to become um, pervasive in infrastructure such, are, such as power and traffic networks. Not yet so, but I think you know, very, we are close to, to having uh, those capabilities seen very soon. And also, they are going to become part of our productive system um, in agriculture, farming, and manufacturing, as you know. So we better um, know how to manage and control these networks that are going to affect us so much. Hopefully, to work as something as nice as the brain over there, which is uh, complex and efficient. OK, so let's see if I move this. Yeah. Okay, another question is uh, whether uh, we want these networks to be so large, right? What are pros and cons of having these very large networks? The truth is that we have our robotic labs that are contained and for which we have developed a very good algorithms that are robust in many different ways, right? And what if we have, you know, many of these agents, right? 
So what are the advantages of this? Well, pros are that having a very large N, you will have more, in principle, more redundancy and tolerance to failure in the sense that you won't care if a few of these robots disappear or die, right? On the other hand, it's not so clear uh, that whatever we have right now that works for a small scale can be applicable and work as well for a very large scale. So there may, may be problems that appear from uh, lack of uh, efficiency, performance degradation of our algorithms because of the large size, and also if we want to manage these networks, these swarms, these designs start becoming uh, more and more intractable. Okay, so there are many uh, issues here we have to deal with. And that's what uh, inspired this, you know, another uh, take on this uh, type of problems on algorithm design and network design for very large swarms. And so um, one can take different uh, modeling approaches to do this. And the one we decided to go with is just use fluid models, partial differential equations. Okay, so uh, this, why? Because, well, these are tools that are available for us that, you know, for which we have many uh, theoretical results. On the other hand, I think we still have to adapt them to deal with issues like um, we want our dis uh, computations to be distributed and to be implementable by a you know, robotic uh, network in a distributed way. We also want to um, account for non-traditional interactions, not just geometric uh, interactions that go from one side to another of the robotic group. And also, you know, other limitations like, okay, you deploy these systems in an environment that is very small for which, you know, there is no GPS or anything like this, no? So what do you, what do you do? So th these are the type of questions we started to, to look at in this framework. And uh, this is some incomplete literature in this uh, regard. And apologies if, you know, I'm not including here uh, many works. Uh, but, the, you know, there are different things that you can do when you have very large uh, networks. So, so, for example, you can use uh, Markov chains. And you basically what this consists of is taking your spatial domain, discretizing it into boxes, and then look at each box. You consider that box to be one entry in your uh, state. Okay, and then you look at the dynamics, you know, that evolves this, this uh, combined state. And so that's, for example, viewpoint that um, Annie Sie uh, took and others from coming from the Vijay Kumar group from UPenn. Uh, other people like, you know, Sigmese and people from originally uh, coming from JPL have looked for the coordination of satellites. Um, it's been something that, you know, has been studied a lot in um, looking, analyzing large ecological systems. So, for example, the work by Alessina. And, you know, other than Markov chains, we have other, other approaches. Well, PDE models, you know, I, I think I could mention uh, many people here, like Alex Bayen, Andrea Bertocci, and Miroslav Kristic, for example, at UCSD, right? Um, but there are, you know, other other things like, for example, statistical physics, you could uh, find some early works of uh, Doyle and Carlson analyzing the fra fragility of complex systems, right? And taking this viewpoint uh, from a statistical physics. Then there is other body of work um, that looks at these systems when you try to um, you know, design algorithms that are somehow optimal, right? So, for example, optimal transport has been applied for, you know, large swarms, and we find the work by Ferrari, also Tune, Hade, at JPL, and Trifon Georgiou, for example. However, the distributed properties of this are not so, you know, so well defined over here. And then there is another body of work on mean field games by Keynes. Nuno Martins recently, and so on, okay? So anyway, um, that's somehow, you know, the picture of um, what to do when you have these large swarms. Now, what I'm going to do uh, today is I'm going to focus on uh, two main problems that have to do with deployment of these swarms or self-organization. 
um, by means of uh, algorithms that are distributed that we design from gradient flows, basically. And this is um, essentially generalizing what we know for the discrete uh, setting. Okay, basically we look for algorithms that are gradient, no? And um, so, so then I'll talk about two topics. Uh, one is optimal transport of these swarms. The other is self-organization when agents do not have access to position information and what to do in those cases. And then probably at this point, you, everybody will be <laughs> bored and then I'll stop, okay? So I'll talk about you know, some other ongoing work that I have about network design and so on. Okay, so uh, self-organization is like the analogs that you have to formation control or deployment, but for a continuum of agents. Okay, so here the goal is simply you want to uh, achieve a certain macroscopic density raw star of your swarm. Okay, something that looks like this in 1D or in 2D that basically at every point tells you concentration of agents. Okay. And so we are going to make a standard assumptions here as in um, distributed cooperative control, right? So agents have uh, local uh, communication capabilities. They also have, you know, local computation. Uh, they can take local measurements, right? And here the measurements, we are going to assume that they are uh, functions essentially that depend on the local density, okay? And also, uh, this is somewhat different maybe from a distributed, uh, the discrete setting, they have to know the target uh, density raw star. All right, so, okay, now um, we have a density, right? So uh, the natural way of modeling the evolution of these densities through the continuity equation, which is something uh, like, that looks like this, right? On the evolution of rho. Uh, v there is the velocity control field. It takes this form, and so this is going to tell what is the control input, uh, ui or vi, for an agent that is located at position xi. Okay, and so what we want to do again is find something that is locally computable by agents. We are going to ask for request this for you know simplicity of analysis. We have conservation of of agents, but you know a few agents could die doesn't really matter. And then that it guarantees that uh, we approach this density as prescribed by some metric in some space, you know, as time goes to infinity. Okay. And in addition, we may uh, minimize some, some cost. For example, an optimal mass transfer criterion and, and so on. Okay. So, so how do we do this? Um, so again, you know, as, as you do in um, standard formation control, right, what do you do? Well, you use Lyapunov tools, try to find a Lyapunov function. This Lyapunov function is going to measure somehow what's the distance between, you know, the density and the goal density, right? And we are going to take a velocity field so that, you know, it, it is aligned with the gradient of this Lyapunov function. Basically, that, that's what we want to do. Okay, so uh, what are possible <coughs> Lyapunov functions or distances that you can consider? So there are many. Okay, these are a few samples of them. You have the L2 distance, which is, you know, here I'm, I'm considering these views are densities, or you can assume that they are normalized and they are probability density functions, okay? So you have the L2 standard L2 distance or you can take the KL uh, divergence, right? There is some other distance that is this one, for example, total variation distance, which is just measuring um, how, uh, how the, the functions are different per integrals over different measurable sets, okay? Uh, or there is this other uh, thing, this is a Wasserstein distance, right? And this is, I'm gonna get into this later, but basically, this is defined using um, a probability, probabilistic coupling here. Uh, this is a PDF whose marginals are the original densities, okay, and that, that we put in here. And then there is a certain cost of coupling, right, of moving a point from X to Y that is given by this uh, norm to the P, okay? So 
Uh, so Wasserstein distance uh, takes the infimum over all the possible couplings, right? And that gives you a number. You take the square p root, the p root of this, and that's the p Wasserstein distance. Okay, so it's another metric that, that you can take. You go from simpler to more complex, right? Okay, so um, okay, so we take these distances, and now we say, okay, let's evaluate uh, possible, you know, gradient um, flaws here, right? So uh, it turns out the following, you have the following simple result, which is the following. So if you just take the gradient of this, this is a distributional derivative of, of the Lyapunov function, which is basically the integral of the derivative of what is inside. So if you take this V, uh, and then you use this uh, velocity field with a continuity equation, so the solutions, you know, that assuming they are well posed and so on, they are going to converge um, to rho star in the L2 sense when the, the distances are the L2 distance or the KL uh, divergence, okay? More precisely, this velocity field looks like this for L2 and like this for the KL divergence. So it's something that you see you can compute, uh, an agent can compute locally, okay? Because it is a function that is, depends on the target density and also the uh, local density that they can measure. So they can measure, they can approximate derivatives, okay? So um, the proof of this is very extremely simple. It's just the Lasalle invariance principle. You take time derivative of this, turns out that you can upper bound by something that is negative, right? And then uh, if you apply this principle, you, you, know, you, you get convergence to uh, the largest invariant set that makes this zero, okay? Which is something like this. Now, using convexity of these um, Lyapunov functions is that you can, can conclude, okay, the convergence has to be to rho star. Okay, so it's... It's simple, it's just gradient, direct gradient, Lasalle principle, you have it, no? Now, uh, things get more complicated when, oops, I'm going backwards, when uh, you wanna look at other metrics, no? So for example, this transport metric, how do you, you know, take gradients there is a bit difficult. But there is something that you can do, and actually, you know, after uh, all we know about distributed optimization algorithms and constraints, we can, uh, you know, there are things we can do. Okay, so uh, to show you this, follow up uh, with me here. So suppose that you have, uh, you're going to consider a cost of transport. So trans what you want to do is you know, rearrange uh, density into another in some optimal way, right? And so you consider a metric C that represents the unit co cost of transport in moving from X to Y. And so now, um, how can you find the optimal uh, transport? So uh, you can try to solve this optimal uh, transport problem, right? Uh, here I have uh, two formulations of the problem. One is deterministic, the other is stochastic but they are equivalent under some conditions, right? So over here, uh, this is the representation of this, right? You wanna move that density into that density into some, in some optimal way so that you minimize this cost. This transformation is represented by this transport map uh, T, right? So basically, you just wanna find the T that minimizes this cost, right? It's an integral cost. So T would be the optimal transport map. Equivalently, you can formulate it in a probabilistic way. Instead of deterministic T, you talk about probabilistic pi, right? And basically, you want to find the pi that, you t that takes one PDF into the other, you know, with minimal cost. It's exactly the same, but here we have a probabilistic transport, okay? Good. So, um, so in particular, they are equivalent under some conditions. For example, that C has to be metric, some other condition, and you know PDFs have to be uh, atomless. This is what what they need to be. Okay. 
And uh, they are equivalent in the sense that if you solve this problem, basically you recover the solution to this problem because the optimal P is going to concentrate on the, uh, you know, the, the graph of the optimal transport map. Okay, so, um, so we have this problem here, and, and again, we want to find a gradient algorithm, right? So what to do? Um, so let's take this problem, right, like, like this over here, the probabilistic uh, one, and we want to find this pi. So, you know, first thing that you notice is, okay, this is actually um, a linear programming problem in pi. Okay, it's nothing else. So uh, we can use um, a standard theory, a standard duality theory, and uh, find the, um, the, dual, uh, the dual problem, which is completely equivalent to the first one because it's linear programming problem. And so over here, this is the Kantorovich dual. We have changed our decision uh, variables, right? Before it was p. Now we have a couple of functions, phi and psi. Uh, we want to, you know, maximize the sum of integrals, but subject to this uh, cost given by this tra unit uh, transport uh, cost here, okay? Now, um, the solution pair uh, psi and phi to this problem is called um, conjugate uh, function pair, okay? It's totally equ equivalent to the first one, and this looks better for uh, coming up with a distributed algorithm because we have these integrals and we have, you know, we can take derivatives. The only problem is this constraint. And so what we do is we manipulate it a little bit more so that we can do it. And so uh, with a bit of manipulation, we get to another uh, equivalent representation where now I've put already the rho and the rho star there. Um, we need some assumptions for this, like the cost is metric, but we were assuming this. And then we just have one problem in one decision variable that is this phi uh, subject to this uh, inequality constraint. Okay, so now this is something that we can handle. Um, to do this, we just, you know, take a Lagrangian function over here of the problem with this constraint, which is a modification with the squares, and we are using a Lagrange multiplier there, right? And now, you know, this is a convex, still this is a convex problem, so we can find, uh, try to find necessary and sufficient conditions for a solution to be uh, optimal. Basically, these are KKT uh, conditions. So this is, you know, this is what, what is going to give us the key to come up with a distributed algorithm. Basically, over here, these two conditions uh, come from just the stationarity property of the optimal solution. And you look at it and you see, you know, this is like a von Neumann uh, boundary condition. This is like a, you know, weighted Laplacian operator with some forcing term here. It's like a Poisson equation. And this, all of these equations come from uh, complementary slackness. Okay, so we have, you know, optimal solution, the optimal transport uh, problem solution needs to satisfy these equations. So if I get the right, the right thing, now from there we can, uh, you know, we can totally handle this constraint in a distributed way. What we can do is define a primal dual dynamics, uh, in this case it's a second order uh, primal dual dynamics. The primal flow is just gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to the first function, the first uh, argument, the phi, which is giving me this, right? This is the, that, you know, diffusion, weighted diffusion equation. The second part is, um, it's just the equation on the multipliers, and I take here it to be second order. We have a first part, which is, you know, it's going to depend on a projection that depends on lambda. This is a projection operator. And the second part, this is, you know, the acceleration that we design. So this is our control variable, this beta, that, you know, that we are going to drive uh, to zero in an appropriate way. Okay? So, 
So basically, yeah, so th this is what we have, and this is completely distributed. Okay, this part is distributed, you know, I'm gonna show you in a second, and it works. So this is what we can prove. So provided you have this condition on the beta, on the control input, which you know needs to be bounded so that essentially we have a negative term, eventually the solutions are gonna convert to the solutions of the optimal transport, okay? So that's essentially great because basically, okay, we don't have a gradient algorithm, but we have a primal dual dynamics that now with all we know about you know hybrid systems, projections, and so on, so on and so forth, we know how to analyze, we convert uh, to this solution. So uh, essentially, what do we come up with? So we come up with uh, this algorithm. It's um, you know algorithm implemented in two time scales. Uh, in the outer loop, you have your continuity equation, with this is the expression of the uh, velocity field, that is using this uh, lambda and phi that solve in a fast time scale uh, this primal dual dynamics over here. Okay, so if you do this then uh, solutions will converge uh, to raw star, okay? And, you know, the, the longer you run this inner loop iteration, the closer you are to the uh, velocity that gives you the optimal transport. Okay, so it's an approximated uh, optimal transport uh, problem solution implemented in a distributed way. I want to emphasize that things are distributed because if, for example, you discretize, right, everything you need to implement this algorithm can be found with local information, right? So, for example, to find this guy, basically, you need to make averages of directional derivatives that can be computed with local information. Uh, to compute this guy, basically, that's like a Laplacian operator applied to a, to a variable, right? So what you have to do is approximate these integrals with local information, you can do that. And the time update, is, you know, it's, it's very simple because you just need the agent information about, you know, what is the previous value of your fee and these terms that can be computed in this way. So everything is local. And you can, you know, plug, put it, this into some algorithm that is, you know, a distributed algorithm, you know, that I show here very quickly. So uh, this is a simulation of how this works. Uh, is as I say, it's a density rearrangement. We wanna go from a uniform density on a 50 by 50 square onto a little cross here. Here, this is also uh, uniform uh, density over this cross, right? And so uh, what we do is this outer loop, inner loop uh, algorithm implementation, okay? And we wanted to compare how uh, the solution uh, quality changes as you increase the number of iterations. In any case, for any iteration, for any number of iterations, we get the goal of getting to, to this density, right? Now, as you increase n, uh, you are gonna get this uh, decreasing trend. This is in the error of rho minus rho star, right? So uh, the way, you know, this decreases, as n increases, you know, it decreases faster, okay? And actually here with um, n equal to 15 is when, when we see that, you know, the difference between 15 and 50 are, are the same, okay? So we really, are almost implementing the optimal transport uh, solution. Okay, so, so you see that, you know, this, this improves with a few iterations. Anyway, uh, in any case, these are some initial uh, simulations that we have on this topic, and, you know, we are doing some more, uh, more work. I'll come back to that later. But the thing is that I wanted to translate is that, okay, yeah, you can do distributed algorithms via gradient flows, even if your uh, Lyapunov functions are, can be a bit complicated. Now, um, let me look at the second part, which is this um, self-organization without position information. Okay, what we do here? So, uh, it's the same problem. 
uh, but where I'm going to change some of the assumptions. Okay, so uh, so here agents yeah, can uh, have local communication and computation capabilities, but I'm uh, going to leave the assumption that they know their position and uh, they don't know where they are, but however, they have a knowledge of the cardinal points, so you, they have um, a common orientation, right, of the reference, reference frame. Um, the only measurements they have access to is uh, local measurements of the density, okay? So what do you do if you want to move uh, a density into another density? Uh, note that the previews that I was showing you, they all require position information, okay? They need, you need to know exactly where you are in order to know what is the V that you need to implement, okay. So, um, so I mean, what can you do? Well, the only thing you can, you can do, or that we thought of, is, well, agents will have to uh, somehow compute an approximation of coordinates, where they are, okay, with these measurements. And so uh, that's what we are going to do. So, uh, and then the problem is going to be solved in a transform, all the time in a transform coordinate system. Okay, so, so in the law, we are going to use a transform objective, P star instead of rho star, by means of some rho star dependent coordinates that I call theta star. And then, in the meantime, you know, in the execution of these algorithm agents are going to use uh, pseudo-coordinates to approximate intermediate uh, diffeomorphisms. And then the algorithm is going to use this x, this p star, and local measurements of rho. Okay. So this is what is going on. So, um, so all the time, agents are going to be using uh, diffeomorphisms, this is for the 1D case, a diffeomorphism that depends on this row, okay? And actually, it's such that, you know, it's going to commute in a certain way uh, according to a diagram like this, okay? Because they, are, they really are going to use this P in their law, okay? And so uh, then the dynamics is going to be enlarged. We just don't have a continuity equation only. We have continuity equation plus coordinate approximation computation, okay? We have a feedback loop like this. This is a continuity, right? With the current density, they are going to try and compute what is this x variable. And then this x variable is going gonna, is gonna to be used for control. I'm sorry about the, <laughs> the microphone. Okay, so, uh, so that's, you know, in a feedback loop, this is what we are trying to do. Basically, we are just trying to come up uh, with a way of compensating the fact that they don't know where they are. Okay. So, uh, what, can be, what can be a good coordinate transformation? So, that's why we look at 1D and 2D. Because, you know, we started looking at 1D, things were easy, then in 2D things uh, didn't work anymore. So, in 1D, uh, what you can do is, you know, you have a density like this, it's defined over a domain that is connected, okay? So, you know, it's continuous great, then you can define a cumulative density function, right? If you do that, you're going to have differentiable mapping here, and it's going to be one-to-one, -one, okay? If this is continuous, you know, things are great. So that could be our, our um, you know, coordinate change, right? So for every density, we can define a theta, for rho star, we can define a theta star, right? And so what we are going to do is we are going to find coordinates, pseudo-coordinates that approximate this theta for every t. And then what we want is that as t evolves, goes to infinity, we have x goes to theta star and rho goes to rho star. Okay? That's, that's the idea. Okay, so uh, let me explain what is this, um, you know, dynamics in 1D for a simple case. You have a constant density, okay? With a constant density, the cumulative is just the identity, right? Okay, so now think in discrete, you know, number of agents, which is what I, you know, it was, you know, it was simpler for me to think. 
if I have a discrete number of agents, right, all I want to do is I want each agent to get to a value x that especially corresponds to, you know, to a deployment that is equidistant, you know, having equidistant, uh, maintaining the same distance from agent to agent. Okay, because that's like an approximation of this identity mapping. Okay. How, you know, what is, what, what algorithm do we have that achieves this? So just a consensus algorithm works. Okay, we fix the uh, two values of the boundary agents to be at zero and at one, right, over here. For all other agents, I pick any initial condition, say zero, and then I apply a consensus averaging algorithm. Okay, if, if you run this for, you know, uh, many times, you are going to achieve this deployment, or in other words, you are going to have an identity, you know, every agent goes to a unique position in zero one, one and this is exactly, you know, increasing and, and straight, okay? So that's for the, flat, the constant density. What if you have a density that is not constant? Well, it's exactly the same thing, but what we have to do is, you know, uh, include here weights that depend on the density, okay? So um, that's what we do, right? And so to do this, I'm going to apply some tricks. Um, so this basically is the algorithm we have, right? It's a consensus algorithm. Now, suppose this is an algorithm that actually works for any uh, density, right? We are going to, you know, we, we want to have PDEs, right? So we are going to use finite difference approximations to replace these values over here like this, right? I'm using, you know, these are in the theta, the theta world, okay? And so I have all of this. That's why I, I you know, I have theta here because these x values belong to the zero one, the, the range of the theta. Uh, then I plug into the equation, I simplify, I ignore higher order terms, I have those values, and, okay, what have I done? Uh, yeah, so basically I simplify, I ignore higher order terms, and, you know, when I change back to x coordinates, right, I basically am using this chain rule, and because I have this derivative here, that's how the density will show up. Okay, so um, that's my equation now for the pseudo coordinates in continuous domain using uh, the density. Okay, so um, so that's what you know. Now we put together and we analyze, see if we converge. Okay, and um, you know what we need to to find out actually is define what is the v and the boundary controls so that eventually I have convergence as I want, from x to theta star, from rho to rho star, okay? And so, you know, we tried some. This, these are the first we tried. I think we can do better now. But basically, uh, what I want to show here, this is second order, so it, you know, it's a bit more involved. But basically, uh, this term over here, is trying to make the difference between rho and rho star uh, small, because this is just rho star, right? So this is going to try to make that small. This term over here is basically is an, an estimate of theta, theta star, okay? In fact, if you um, just put x equal to theta star, so suppose that you are, you know, you already have the right coordinates, this just simplifies to, to this. Okay, so it's measuring somehow, you know, what's the difference between uh, rho and rho star. It's like one of these gradient laws, okay? The thing is that we have an integral here in the, in the middle, okay? But essentially it's that, okay? And so we have convergence, you know, some assuming densities are far away from zero, of course. Uh, that would be the discretized version and I just show this to, you know, to show you that, you know, it's using P star, it's using X, and it's using rho. Okay, this rho I is the, the value of the density at point I, right? It's nothing else, you know, so it's, it's you know, 
pseudo-coordinate information and local information that you can measure. And this is a, okay, an initial simulation. It's not great. <laughs> it's just showing, you know, with this law uh, implemented in the discrete setting, we go from this density to the desired one. I mean, it, it could be, I guess it could be a better simulation, but this is what I have. Um, now, uh, what happens if you go to 2D? Um, so in 2D, uh, you can say, well, let's do the same, right? So um, well, here is where you see that our solution in 1D was not uh, great, but still there are some ideas that we can use for the 2D case. Uh, there are, well, there are two difficulties. First, um, first, the most important is that the cumulative distributions do not work here anymore for coordinate computation, OK? And why is that? Because you can imagine that if you have um, any domain in 2D, it could be non-convex, you take any density over this domain, non-convex, nasty thing, you, you can imagine that uh, there are two points in this, you know, for some density there are two points that are going to give you exactly the same uh, cumulative distribution value, which is just you know, some integral, right? So depending how you define this row over the domain, you know, it's not gonna, you are not going to have a unique value per point, OK? So it's, it's not going to give you a diffeomorphism, a one-to-one -one mapping. And then, of course, the analysis is harder because we are in 2D. And we couldn't, you know, come up with a, such a nice analysis, you know, of, of the whole feedback system feedback interconnected system, we had to do a two time scale separation. But anyway, so um, also the boundary, you know, the 1D algorithm, they have to do a 1D algorithm at the boundary. And um, yeah, and, and then the rest is, you know, looking at what happens inside. So, um, so let me tell you about the coordinates, right? What do we do? So what we do is we get inspiration from the 1D case again uh, and the discrete uh, situation, OK? So in the 1D case, we fixed the boundaries. We looked at averages in, inside the, the domain. Here we are going to have uh, to transform our density not from a domain to 0, 1, but from a domain to a unit circle, OK? So uh, first thing we do is we are going to fix the transformation of the boundary onto the unit circle by means of some uh, diffeomorphism that we do, say, this w in this way. Suppose that your boundary is smooth. You can define this one-to-one -one mapping. Great, OK? And in the interior, how about if we do averaging as before, right? We can do that. Um, this would be, you know, this R is just uh, a vector now of, you know, components X and Y. But other than this, you know, we have the typical averaging uh, law is the same. And we can, you know, use these tricks of finite difference approximations to come up with a continuous version, and it's this. Uh, where we have, again, um, a Laplacian that has this density so Laplacian operator with a row inside, row dividing and so on, this you know, term is, is analogous to the 1D case. Okay? Now the question is whether or not this is going to converge to uh, coordinates. Okay? So uh, that was the whole problem. That was one of the problems here. And regarding this, I have um, two results. The first result is that at least we know that if we look at the steady state of this equation, we put here a zero. We have an equation like this. This is on the boundary is the diffeomorphism, right? So, uh, so one can prove that, oh, the dynamics will converge exponentially fast to, to the steady state. This is something we prove. But moreover, uh, we can guarantee that the solution is a unique uh, mapping. OK, it's unique from any, you know. Uh, so I mean, there is only one R that satisfies these two equations, OK? 
Now, what we really want to answer is, you know, what conditions guarantee that this mapping is actually a diffeomorphism of coordinates, okay? So let me answer this in a second. Uh, in any case, what is this R in order, again, to try to reproduce the scheme uh, we had in the 1D case? We have a continuity equation here. We have now these coordinates. We would like to solve this. We can't because it's 2D. We, we weren't able to. So we apply a two, you know, time scale separation. And uh, this is going to run in a slow time scale. This is going to run in a faster time scale. Okay? Still, we are using, you know, this R is this whole idea of density dependent uh, coordinates. And so, um, so the thing is that we can do this only under certain conditions of the target density. And we have to uh, resort to a um, you know, special theory in differential geometry, OK? This is what we have. We have that if you take this uh, velocity field, <coughs> assuming that you know, the boundary doesn't have to do anything, uh, then we are going to convert uh, to uh, rho star from, you know, almost everywhere rho star from any, from any uh, smooth initial uh, density. Okay. How do we do this? Well, there's a lot of analysis to do. And, yeah, I know, you know, you must be tired now. But um, basically, you know, we have, again, term to make rho approach rho star terms to make, you know, our our R convert, converge to R star, okay? So uh, if you use some standard LaSalle principle, uh, well, first you have this negative uh, trend of the derivative, that's great. You get to be dot equals zero, but that implies that you are in rho star if and only if you have converged to the diffeomorphism here. <laughs> but this, this side, you can prove that is the solution to this equation. And we said, OK, this is a unique solution. And this is where we have to use this theory. It's a theory from uh, Riemannian deformations from differential geometry that exactly looks at this topic, these harmonic maps, mappings. OK, and you know, they, there is a result that says that um, under some conditions on the curvature of this P star, the unique solution to this equation is a diffeomorphism. So, uh, you know, these are some conditions on negative cur curvature, so it doesn't work for every P star, but just for a few P star. And so, uh, so under this assumption, everything would work. Okay, but we need this theorem from, uh, from that theory. This is just an illustration that uh, the thing works. We actually, I mean, it's just the continuity equation part of the implementation, but, you know, uh, just to show in a picture that we are doing this. Anyway, so uh, that's all. Uh, let me summarize now. Um, so we started with this idea, OK, we have these very large scale uh, swarms. Uh, what can we do to control them? What we want to do is account for limitations that are, you know, characteristics of uh, swarms, right? And so um, we wanted to have, for sure, distributed algorithms, right? So, for example, for optimal transport, uh, we could do this uh, by using primal dual dynamics and recent results in distributed optimization. That's basically the main takeaway idea. Uh, for um, scenarios where uh, robots do not have access to position information, which is, you know, very common, especially if you imagine you consider, you know, these are very tiny robots in a certain location. There you cannot use GPS, right? So um, still, if these robots have computation capabilities, you know, they can make up for a coordinate computation, okay? Uh, coordinate computation, uh, that depends on density, right? And it's kind of, uh, to me, it looks like a sort of a, like a range measurement from agents at the boundary 
but instead of uh, measuring ranges, you are accumulating uh, density sums. Okay, that's what is what, what it is. Uh, regarding optimal transport, we are looking into more aspects of this problem. So instead of just discrete uh, approximations, we want to look at the relationship with Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain uh, sampling algorithms because these algorithms are super decentralized. Okay, and so we want to look at you know what is an algorithm in between that maybe modifying with neighbor information, we can uh, get uh, solutions that could get closer to what is the optimal transport plan, okay? And we have some preliminary results that you know, seem to indicate this, this is a good idea to pursue. Uh, I also looked at, uh, large, we also looked at large network design in the, from the point of view of um, you have a very large network with an arbitrary topology. Uh, how do you identify critical nodes that make, you know, uh, diffusion type of algorithms perform worse? Okay, and so uh, so to do this, what we do is we transform this, you know, take this network and embed it, embed it appropriately into some Euclidean space. Once you are in the Euclidean space, you can use. Uh, also classical tools in operator theory to, to study this. And we came up with some nice results that, you know, um, actually are a good match with what is known about, oh, more, more critical nodes are nodes that, you know, have a better centrality and so on. So, so which is kind of nice. And this is, this is will appear in the uh, TCNS. And that's it. So uh, these are my students. This is the one who, you know, mostly work on this topic. And if you have any questions, please ask now. <laughs> Thank you. So um, can you compare this approach to the Markov chain results that you alluded to earlier? which are fairly simple to implement. Um, so what are the pros and cons of what you're proposing? So I would have to look uh, more into these Markov chain methods. But for example, they try to do look at optimal transport, distributed transport in this, for these Markov chains. And there is no satisfactory solution as far as I can tell. I mean, no distributed algorithm. Um, Probably it could be, you know, translated. Once you have the idea in one, you know, with one formulation, you can probably come up with a similar mm -hmm. idea in the other formulation. Um, now, regarding complexity, um, I think it's, it's going to be similar. No, I mean, um, in a Markov chain, what you do is averages with the states of other, you know, neighboring states, right? <laughs> What you have to do is you have to assume that every agent who is in, a, in the same box has to, have to communicate with all of the agents that are in adjacent boxes. So in that sense, you know, this method does not assume this, right? Because that's what uh, the Markov chain people do, these guys I mentioned. You have your domain. I mean, maybe, maybe it's equivalent, depending on how large you take the box. But you know, agents that are here, these guys have to communicate with everybody here, with everybody here, right? So that they can update uh, their states. Today, I, my understanding of those was, you know, you just need to have a distribution associated with every bin is a probability of, you know, moving right or left or up or down. Exactly. And so but my understanding was so you just need to know your location and that's all. But and in that, order to update, uh, but in order to come up with a distributed algorithm, mm -hmm. right, you would have, you would have uh, something like this, no? This is discrete now, mm -hmm. right? So in order to, to update this guy, you know, this is uh, sum in J of rho T, J, A, 
i j or something like this no mm -hmm. so um, so if i'm a robot right and i need to and yeah, i need to know how to move uh, to an adjacent or how to you know yeah if i if i need to update this this density right how do you compute it you know in a in a distributed way how does a robot itself compute this density in order to decide how to how to move you know that um we can discuss this later but my understanding is that everything is pre-computed with respect to a desired distribution so associated with every bin in that figure you know you just need to have some basically yeah. each agent would have a lookup table oh. where am i and what probability with what probably should i go up or down but we can look into those later I'm, yeah I'm a little yeah rusty no on my concern also. there is uh you know mm -hmm. you have a lookup table but mm -hmm. how do you update this how do you compute this table no somebody does it ahead of time i think that's exactly the, but here no here every robot does the computation locally mm -hmm. at every time so that, that's the difference so the other question I had was, I don't want to take the time, but um, how important is it to prescribe the um, P star? So it's I mean, important. what applications call for that, and can, you, can that be relaxed somehow? Um, so given that, yeah, it's important. It's like uh, giving the raw star. If, if you don't give it to, to them, they don't know essentially what, where to do, uh, what, what to do. Um, what applications? Um, I don't know. If you have uh, like a large network of sensors, right, and you broadcast to everybody, okay, this is your raw star or your P star, then you know everybody would know uh, what to do with distributed with a distributed algorithm. It's just for I don't know moving around a mass of agents uh, for different purposes. Uh, but yeah, it is important for the for the algorithm to work, because somehow they have to know what is the goal of this motion, and you know how else are you gonna are you gonna tell them? I mean, you would have to encode that somehow into the velocity control, right? Yeah, but I'm not sure how to how to solve that problem without without knowing this, basically. Okay, we can continue. Yes, yeah, thank you. We have time for one more question. Uh, so in the uh, primal dual formulation, uh, at some point you, ha you used some triangle inequality. So the derivation there, I couldn't follow. But I was wondering what was the, <laughs> yeah, what was the main assumptions? Yeah. Are you giving up something there to so, do the decomposition? So, uh, so okay. So the so I need triangular inequality. I mean, it's symmetric at the end of the day. So, uh, and I can show you later in a, in the paper if you want. But basically, let me see. So it's, it's just um, an assumption that we need to reshape this problem into the next one. And so we want to um, basically get rid of one of the integrals. And using this property plus triangular inequality, we can do that. We can prove that the optimal psi is minus the phi. And you know, it's just a computation I can show you. But yes, you need, you need that property. Uh, you don't lose anything if you assume that you know triangular inequality holds, but that's a restriction on your on your cost. I mean, if if it's symmetric, it's not a really a restriction, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> no.